Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. Um, before we get into this next one, I just wanted to put a little addendum to the A Night to Remember review. Something that I didn't quite get a chance to mention, but basically this was to reinforce something that um, was said in the Plinkett review and and something that something that I noticed is, is that in most of the Titanic adaptations, the, the insert of a love story is a means of connecting the audience to the tragedy because it's one thing to see a large ship and to be aware of the fact that 1,500 people uh, drowned as a result. Um, it's, it gets into the, like, how do I, how do I identify this? How, how do I really feel the impact? And the easiest way to feel the impact is, is if you have a fictional love story that takes place on the ship and you have characters that you connect to emotionally and that's the bare minimum. Um, it doesn't matter if they have necessarily any depth or complexity to it. It's just basically it provides you a, um, an emotional pull that pulls you into the pulls you into the event, um, and this is something that has historically been done. And of course, James Cameron uses that um, not so much for the for the sake of the love story, but more to pull you into the event. Because I think what he was more interested in was the event itself and how do you portray that in film, uh, make it very action uh, very action packed, very exciting, very visceral. Um, the love story was a bonus. Um, and I've, I've, I've actually, um, and Plinka has also said this, that the action is, that it's, it should be, should have been thought of more as an action film than as a romance film. But I think because of the time it came out, and I think also because of the audience attraction, because if you advertised it as an action film, what, what will happen is typically, the males would be excited by this. The females would kind of groan, but then it becomes a date movie, and then eventually, and then when they come out, so when they come into the theaters, the men are excited, the women are not as enthusiastic, and then coming out of it, it's it's reversed. <laughs> um, so I think maybe it was just to save a step. It's like you know, let's just advertise this as a as a as a romance. It's more a romance film than than as an action film, and of course, it created its own backlash but it was seemingly minor compared to the success and the point is that a night to remember avoids all of that it just it's it just focuses on the event itself and proving that you don't really need the emotional story as much I mean there's, there's enough stories in the in in the event itself that lends itself to the drama so you don't need that extra excess so okay now we got that out of the way let's go on to the next dvd which is the seventh seal directed by igmar bergman 1957. okay there are some films that are considered I mean, I'm probably sure I've said essential viewing once or twice in these things, but there are definitely some films that are up there as essential canon viewings. You've probably heard Citizen Kane mentioned a whole bunch of times. You've probably heard Casablanca mentioned a whole bunch of times. The Seventh Seal is one of them. Now, the thing about essential viewings is that... Just because they're essential viewings does, you, doesn't necessarily mean you, you may like them. Um, you may have to watch Citizen Kane in some introduction to film studies or, um, or Casablanca or The Rules of the Game or any of those films. Um, you may have to, and you may appreciate the, the craftsmanship behind it, but in the end you may just feel like, you know what, I'm not really I don't really see the grab and that's just a personal thing this is kind of how I feel with the seventh seal and I and it's not that I and I certainly don't hate the seventh seal far from it far from it but I don't feel this 
wow, it's the greatest film ever. In a couple of episodes, you'll, you'll know what that is. <laughs> um, but I don't feel this excitement or this, wow, this is, this is such an important film. And I've been, and in rewatching it, I am trying to figure out exactly why this ambivalence is there. You would think that, um, you think that it won't be. I mean, for starters, um, just a basic recap for anyone who doesn't really know. Um, it's, it takes place in presumably around the 14th century. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. It's, it, it is essentially, it's a medieval tale, but it's a major compression of the Middle Ages. It, it basically, five centuries of history is compressed into, into these few days in, in the context of the story. This knight and his squire comes back, uh, to Sweden from the Crusades. Uh, the latest crusade happened in the 13th century um i know i know there was i know yeah i know there was in the 13th century um but they come back to sweden and the black death is occurring and this was 1347 so in the 14th century and there's also an, an encounter with public flagellants uh, flagellants not flatulence flagellants uh, <laughs> just want to make that absolutely clear Although I'll get to the flatulence later. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, that and uh, the witch hunts, the witch, the witch persecutions didn't happen much later until around the 15th century. So basically it's about 500 or so years of the Middle Ages compressed into this one thing. Um, it's more of an allegory than, than it, it never really passes itself off as a period piece, even though people, even though a lot of the sources come from medieval paintings, including the famous, including the ever famous image of, of Antonius Block, the knight played by Max von Stiedel playing chess with death. It comes from a medieval painting that Igmar Bergman remembered seeing as a, as a child. Um, but it's much more of an allegory than anything else. But anyways, uh, so, so yeah, they come back to Sweden and obviously I've, I've given, but in describing this, I, I kind of give the, the, the story. They, they go back to Sweden. They see that the black death has ravaged, um, uh, portions of Sweden along the way. And there's this set, there's this dread, ever present dread that this is going to be the judgment day because of all these you know, because of the Black Death, because of all these omens, because of everything that's been going on. Um, and then all at the same time, Death uh, wants Antonius Block. And the only way he feels he can keep it at bay is by engaging in this game of chess. Considering how very popular that image is, it's been, it's been, it's been given the homage treatment, and it's certainly been given the parody treatment. Yes, I've seen Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, uh, <laughs> uh, among other things. Um, Animaniacs did a parody of it too. Yeah. So yes, it's been it's a very very famous, well known image. Um, there's only three scenes in the whole thing. Um, but anyways, um, so. Back to the ambivalence. So like, I, I think what it comes down to is that ultimately this is about existential angst. And it's done in a very, in a very symbolic, very allegorical way. And this is something that this, this kind of um, sort of heavy symbolism and, and such um, I think characterizes like early classic Bergman. I mean, there's there's early Bergman where it's just a lot of carryovers from from drama and just playing to a lot of conventional films, but making it a little bit more dramatic. And then the Seventh Seal is what really put him on the map internationally. It's it's uh, it's what made him basically a a household name, certainly amongst filmmakers. Um, it helped kickstart the whole art house cinema seen in the United States uh, I mean it was it was a really really big deal at the time and it and then there's later Bergman which I tend to prefer more 
uh, basically from through a, through a glass darkly onwards, where he drops a lot of the heavy symbolism and goes more for characters and looks at and, and they become more character studies. I, I think I tend to like that more. So maybe that's part of it. The other is is that I don't really share in the existential angst, the kind of existential angst that Bergman himself um, has done. Although to his credit, he doesn't say that that's the only solution. In fact, this is part of the charm of the Seven Seal, is that you have, I mean, you have Antonius Block the Knight, you have Jones, his squire, who's uh, pretty much the modern, the more modern figure. He's very, very cynical. Um, he has the he has the lifestyle of eat, drink, and be merry, and for you may die tomorrow. And so his is is about just experiencing life to the fullest possible way, including sensually, uh, not get into full-blown hedonism. I don't perceive him as a, as a hedonist. Um, and I certainly don't see him as lacking any kind of moral code. Um, he has this encounter with a, um, um, a, uh, a guy named Ravel, who's a theologian. And he was the one who was responsible for, for sending Bloch off to a crusade. And when he comes back, the first, the, when he first meets him, he's robbing, he's robbing a corpse. From a, he's stealing a silver bracelet from a corpse. And yeah, that's, that's theologians for you. But then again, I've hung out with seminarians. I don't... <laughs> I'm sure at some point when there's, there's some crisis moment, they'll probably do that too. Yeah. Um, don't ever think that seminarians are, are... I mean, it's not to say that they're not great people. It's just that don't ever think that they're immune from doing bad things. Um, so, anyways, <laughs> um, so he encounters him and, and, uh, and actually eventually brands him uh, for basically acting like a jackass. Um, he's definitely the worst kind of theologian, <laughs> Ravel. Anyways, um, there's, um, there's also a uh, acting troupe that's, that's also a part of this, um, consisting of... Uh, Mia, played by B. Ernstein, uh, her son, and I forget. I just watched this last night, and shame on me for forgetting the, the juggler's name. Um, it's not Jans. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna waste time trying to remember the names. Forgive me. Um, there's an acting troupe that that's that's part of this as well. Um, so there's, I mean, so it's not just one little view it it asks the questions it presents the scenarios and then it's kind of more or less up to you to kind of figure out you know where you stand although there are some scenes that I think do make their points but it's not it's not all to it's not all arriving at one point or if it is arriving at one point it's basically we all die <laughs> That's, I mean, that's the only, that's as much certainty as you're going to get, is that you're all going to die. Um, but uh, as far as any kind of great answers, you know, the meaning of life, does, um, does God really exist? Is God present even in the midst of our sufferings? And I would say yes, and this film says maybe. So maybe that's, maybe that's part of it, um, part of the ambivalence. Um, also... Maybe another part of it is that I'm not the biggest fan of Bergman. Um, I know plenty of people who are, including the most, his most famous fan, Woody Allen. Um, I have enormous respect for Bergman. I have enormous respect. Um, and I admire his career in general. And there's, there's several films I do like. And I also think that maybe he had inadvertently influenced me in a certain, in a certain way, and and uh, and I do give him credit for that. But as far as you know, filmmakers that I like, I don't even really put him on the top five, maybe top ten, but I'm not sure about top five. And in fact, this was confirmed when back in 2007, um, he and Antonioni died at within days of each other. And while 
I've seen more of Bergman's films um, than Antonioni's films. Um, I felt more, I felt more sad when Antonioni died than when Bergman died. Of course, I, of course, it it was bad. I mean, I, I felt something, but I, I felt more. That's that's what I mean. I felt more something with with Antonioni than I did with Bergman. So it kind of gives you an idea of what appeals to me, even though I think maybe a lot of the stuff that I'm thinking about doing for my own filming is probably more closer to Bergman, um, just in terms of like character stuff. But uh, but like I said, I I tend to like the later Bergman like. Uh, Films like Through a Glass Darkly, Winter Light, um, Cries and Whispers, uh, and of course his real, well, I don't want to say real, but I consider this his cinematic swan song, Fanny and Alexander. Um, yes, I know that Sarabon was released in theaters, but it was made for television. It was, it was basically a theatrical airing of what was shown on television. I don't consider that to be his last film film. His last film film was Fanny and Alexander. Um, he, he shot it as a film in mind. Uh, it, was, it was made in the theaters and he intended that to be his, his final film. Sarban was just, uh, was, it, it did have a theatrical run but that doesn't really count. It wasn't conceived as a film. But at any rate, but I digress. Um, so I mean I do like that but I, I just, I'm not a big, it's not like, oh, Edmar Bergman, he was a, you know, um, my favorite filmmaker. I again, I respect him, but I don't really like him. So, um, but yeah, and I guess I'll mention a few other little things. The the one thing that I will say that the one thing that does kind of annoy me as far as the uh, perception of Bergman is that because like what I just described was very um, very somber. You know, it's you know. A knight playing chess with death. <laughs> I mean, how much more somber and bleak can you get? Um, and that's usually the perception is that Bergman is like this this very weighty thing. It's if it's not if it's not the death dance or or Antonius Block playing chess with death or um, the the two faces shot from Persona. If it isn't that, I mean, that's usually what's what's thought of with Bergman, just these, these very sort of heavy laden, you know, um, characters full of existential angst and, uh, basically a not at all fun version of what Woody Allen films tend to be. Um, but remember Woody Allen is, is probably the biggest Bergman fan and Berg, biggest Bergman admirer. Um, so that kind of stands to reason that maybe Bergman has a little bit of a light side. And that is true. Bergman is, was not one to, was not one for a, a, a certain side of the spectrum. You know, he, his, his, his films do have a spectrum. And, and even, this is even the case with uh, The Seventh Seal. There's one scene where um, a, there's a subplot where this acting troupe is in a village and one of the actors notices the uh, Smith's wife and um, uh, Lisa. <laughs> well, hi, Lisa. Anyways, <laughs> um, and they, they have a tryst. Uh, Scat. Scat's the actor and, and Lisa's the, the, the voluptuous woman. Uh, they have a tryst and the um, Smith suspects this and at a certain point he's um at first off he suspects one of the other actors the actor i can't I, I can't remember his name for the life of me uh um he suspects him and actually taunts him and and you know insults him until he gets and actually Ravel encourages this um but anyways but then the next time you see him he's still in the tavern and very drunk and, ve and very upset. He's, he's slobbering, blubbering to himself, uh, according to Jans the Squire. Um, and the two of them talk. And the way, the way it's shot and the way that they talk to each other is very much, it felt, feels like a, like a TV sitcom scene. Uh, thank you, Peter Cowley, for that description. Um, where they just talk about sort of the, 
the downsides of of having women in the house. I mean, that's really what the conversation is. And but it's said in it, but it's it's a very um, you know, it's a very comedy of matters moment. And this is supposed to be in this, and, and this is supposedly this dirge of a film, but yet there's this, there's this very light moment. There's a lot of other little light moments. It's not marked with, it's not like every single moment is, is, um, has, um, is, is, is drenched with serious, heavy themes. I mean, even death has a comic moment. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll leave you to, to find out what that is. But even death has a comic moment. As a moment of comedy, and I think that's that's actually I would say that that is the the strength of Bergman is that because he has he does have that spectrum, and some films are more comedic than other. Some of his films are more comedic than others. Some of his films are more dramatic and serious than others. But the fact that he has had this spectrum um, throughout his career, uh, I mean, you have comedy films like you have more comedy films like The Devil's Sty, and you have more serious films like Cries and Whispers, and then everything in between. I mean, that, um, you have to at least admire that. You may not like all his films, and you may not, admit he may not rank very high, but you've got to respect that. And that's, and that's what I honestly feel. I, I respect and admire Bergman more than I say, wow, Bergman is the greatest filmmaker ever. I mean, I have, I have plenty of other filmmakers that I like, and over the course of these, you'll know you'll you'll figure out who they are. <laughs> um, so, with all that said, um, I it's it is it is that like I said earlier, it's that essential cinema viewing. It's it's the if you are if you're serious about film, and what I mean is if you if you believe that there there is more to films than what's than what's currently playing now. If you want to know what the possibilities are with cinema, what what can be done, what has been done, um, what makes a good film. If you've ever asked those kinds of questions, if you want, and it's like with reading, you know, there, there are essential books that you, that you read, you know, you read, you read the plays of Shakespeare, you read, um, you read the Canterbury Tales, you read Paradise Lost, you read Don Quixote, you know, these are, you know, essential canon. Seven Seal is is pretty much without contest or without any kind of strong objection um, is essential viewing. You may not, you may end up not liking the film. Again, it's there. There's some people that they're shown Citizen Kane and they absolutely hate it. Um, but and I, and again, I don't hate the Seven Seal. I'm just not the biggest fan of it. I don't think like wow, it's the it's the greatest film ever. Again, you'll know, you'll kind of know what that will be when <laughs> again over the course of this. But if you haven't seen it, do see it. Do see it for yourself and see if you like it. And if you if you don't if you're not really drawn to it, then that's fine. Um, that said, I do recommend it. Put it on your shelf. It, it's it's like having it's like making sure you have a copy of Shakespeare's plays on your shelf or. Um, so have the seventh seal on your shelf. Um, you know, it, it may make you a bit more smarter or something. It, it's, it's a, it's a show off thing, but, um, at any rate, so yeah, I definitely recommend it. And, um, as you probably saw, this is, this is actually the, uh, the, uh, two, yeah, 2009 DVD reissue. Um, it was a much better a uh, much better transfer, a bit more supplements and such. And it's not to say that, and actually I, I initially owned the original uh, 1998 or 99 DVD release. And actually in that one, they actually, they actually re-transferred. They actually, they redid their uh, digital transfer. They were, I think initially a lot in the, in the early days of Criterion, they ported over their, their laser disc releases onto DVD when, when they knew that they could. Um, but then when they saw the seventh seal um, on Laserdisc, they thought, you know, there's some things that could be that, that could be done better, and so they were able to repair a lot of the damages, and and it's it's a much the DVD is is much better than the initial Laserdisc release, and this one just makes it even better. And 
yes, it's available on Blu-ray as well. Um, I guess while I'm on that topic, uh, this, like I said before, this these series are going to cover just the DVDs that I own. Now, what about Blu-ray? Well, I do not have a Blu-ray player, so I do not go on my way to get Blu-ray discs. But even if I did, I'm not... I'm not sure if I want to get Criterion Blu-rays because I, I will have this tendency to want to upgrade my uh, my discs and considering that I'm already at 150 it would be quite a daunting task. Not all of them are available on Blu-ray and also the editions that are available it would mean um, it would mean giving up uh, some you know some things that are unique to the DVD to the initial DVD release. A good example of this would be the Tin Drum, um, the the most recent reissue, which is actually the Hell is the more complete version of of the Tin Drum. Um, it it drops a few supplements that uh, that were there in the DVD. So um, I'm kind of on the fence of that. I'm leaning more towards just leaving it at DVDs. I mean, the, the DVDs, they're, yes, yes, I know the difference between DVD and Blu-ray in terms of resolution. Yes, I know that Blu-ray has, has a much higher resolution than DVDs, but this all comes from Criterion. They, they all use high definition transfers. Uh, they still look great, you know, no matter what the, the format is, it, it, it's, it's its best. Yes, um, Blu-ray edges out because of the resolution and ends up making the films look more filmic. Um, but really, it's just... And I guess, to me, like, old habits die hard. <laughs> I, I've, it's become a habit at this point, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna change it in the middle now. Plus, I'm sure there's going to be some other format that's going to... Um, that's going to trump uh, 1080. In fact, I mean... We, sh we, sh we now shoot films at 4K, and now we're getting to shooting it at 5K. Um, Baraka was a, used an ultra-high-definition uh, mastering process, and that was 8K. And, that's, the, and that's, that's, that's currently the maximum that anybody can do right now. So, mark my words, it's going to be something else that replaces. So, like I said, Seventh Seal... Uh, Definitely watch it if you haven't. Um, it's 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 definitely worth that much um, if you haven't seen it. And and I would even say that it's it's worth the it's it's worth the purchase, given that it is part of that essential film canon. So there you go. So that's the Seventh Seal. And until next time, take care.